in today's show. Let's look at players who might be buy low candidates or sell high candidates. Michael Bolton, he's both. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter, as always, at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. So here we are for a buy low, sell high show. Remembering that a buy low player does not mean you have to acquire that player at any cost. A sell high does not mean you have to dump that player. It doesn't mean you drop that player. It doesn't mean you have to trade them away. It just means you explore. Can you sell this guy at a value which is higher than his rest of season value? Can you acquire the player in a trade for a value which is going to be lower than what he does the rest of the year? That's what we're trying to do. And as I said last week, and apparently there was some confusion because some people weren't happy with my comments saying you don't have to trade, but you don't have to trade. And so you have to be out, you have to trade to win. That's that's blatantly untrue for a start. But what I'm saying is that so many people trade for the sake of trading. In the leagues I'm in, I swear to God, there's been one trade happen all season. I have not made a single trade all season. I'm at the top of the leagues. Oh, actually, that's not true. Not in all of them. In, you know, I think three, three or four of the five, I'm at the top. Um, I've made no trades. But making trades, some people are so itchy to make a trade that it ends up hurting you. So it's always just being cautious, being careful about the trades that you do make and not just doing it for the sake of it. Because that's where you run into trouble. And that's the point that I'm trying to get across. You don't have to make a trade to win. You don't have to make a trade for the sake of making a trade. Make them, and then hopefully it's a good one. That's that's the idea behind it. Let's talk sell highs. People are going to love this one. Um, let's start in Washington. The future MVP, Kyle Kuzma. He has been playing fantastically. Absolutely fantastic stuff from Kuz. Really, really on fire. How real is it, though? Well... It's real if you believe that he will play 38 minutes a night. It's real if you believe that he will score 26 points a night. He will maintain 28% usage a night. And he'll shoot 61% from two-point range. I, personally, Josh Lloyd, do not think any of those things are possible. 38 minutes a night is astonishing. Now, he's been doing this over this two-week period with situations where there's been no Dinwiddie, a usage guy, no Montrezl Harrell, who still isn't back, no Rui Hachimura, who's back and played 14 minutes in, in the whole season. Um, we're going to have the return of Thomas Bryant at some point. And Kuzma's been playing a lot of center as well as Gafford's backup. So while we can say Kuzma's been pretty good this year, he has. I think he's the 95th ranked player this season. Despite all these advantages that he's had, this is a real hot streak and he's putting it together now. Look, you, there are people who fully believe in Kyle Kuzma as a very good player. I quite obviously am not one of them. I didn't mention that he's the 28th ranked player over the last two weeks in category leagues and 19th in points leagues. I have him about 110th, I think, rest of season. Do I think he's better than Rui Hachimura? Yeah, I do. I don't view Hachimura as a very good player at all. I think that the, I thought that if Hachimura was healthy and ready to go at the start of the season, the Wizards, they invest so much in him and believe so much they would have started him over Kuzma. And I think they'll ramp those minutes back up for Rui. Will it come into a situation where he's overtaking Kuzma? I'm not sure at this stage. But I feel pretty confident in saying that 28 usage, 38 minute a night Kuzma is not a real thing. He lacks in assists and steals and blocks. He's still not a great shooter. Um, and and he's, he's on a massive hot streak, rebounding the ball really well. But again, remember, he is playing at center. A lot of the minutes are coming at center. And it's going to go from being one center on the team to being three centers on the team. And his minutes at center are going to go from 15 a game, 20 a game, to zero a game. And that's going to impact the two-point percentage and the rebound numbers. So, if I'm trading away, if I've got Cole Kuzma, <clears throat> I don't actually think I've got him in any league. Maybe I do. I don't know. If I've got him, like, I'm not trading him away for a random top 100 player. I'll see what more I can get. Top 70? Try it. 
Otherwise, you write it out because there is a possibility that he stays playing 35 a night. That's more than he's played all season, but maybe he does. Maybe he takes on the second usage role and Dinwiddie fades into the background and Harrell gets traded. All this is possible. But if you can get a high value, now is absolutely the time to strike with Harrell coming back, with Bryant coming back, and with Hutchinson already back. It's the time to strike, I think, on the future MVP himself, Kyle Kuzma. To show that I'm not biased, and it's not just because I hate Kyle Kuzma, apparently, I think you've got to sell high on Josh Giddy as well. Oh, I like Josh Giddy. I think he's really good. And I've been advocating all season to tell you he is an absolute must-roster player. But he is, over the last two weeks, the 25th-ranked player in category leagues and 37th in points leagues. For the year, he is uh, 99th. All right, so obviously a big step up there. He's playing 33 minutes a night, so it's a little bit of a step up here. But one of the things that's been an issue with Giddy all season is shooting. And over the last two weeks, that hasn't been a problem. He hasn't missed a free throw, right? And this is a guy that's like 65, 68%, a real negative in that area. He's hitting 50% of his threes. And that's, you know, he's hitting two threes a game over four games. So he's eight of 16 over the last two weeks. He's got um, seven steals over those last four games as well. So some really big numbers. It does go to show the absolutely high ceiling that Giddy has for fantasy. He's averaging 13, 10, and 8.3. And 13, 10, and 8.3 for Josh Giddy. I don't think that's completely outrageous to average at some point in his career. I think 16, 9, and 9 is potential for him. But that high-level shooting from the three-point line and from the free-throw line, and we know the percentages are multiple category influences that when two of those things are up, the value takes a big, big leap forward. So I think Giddy, you're looking at maybe a top, is, is you know, banking on being a top 80 guy rest of season. If you can get a top 60 player back, a top 50 player back in a trade, yeah, that's that's the sort of move that I would be, um, I'd be pretty interested in doing. I'm also pretty interested in telling you that Bet Online is wishing you a happy new betting year, continuing their march towards the playoffs. What a heartbreaker it was for Chargers fans, my son included, yesterday. Bet Online is the number one spot for all your sports wagering action for 2022. New year, new updated desktop, or you can use the mobile site, but go sign up and use our promo code Locked On and get a 50% welcome deposit bonus on your first deposit. From basketball, football, hockey, boxing, UFC, or right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait and take advantage of all of the great offers available for 2022. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. Bet Online is where the game starts. Let's go to the next guy. Yeah, I think the Rob uh, Rob Williams is a, is a uh, sell high. He has fluctuated a lot. I was inundated with do I drop Rob Williams questions when he was struggling and playing like 23 minutes a night. And that's where you had to hold firm. And now it's flipped in the other direction. Over his last two weeks, it's six games, he's the 16th ranked player in category leagues and he's 31st in points leagues. Now, do I think Rob Williams is a top 50 guy? Yeah, I do. I think he is, especially with the way they're playing him at the moment. But why is he top 20 at the moment? Well, the first thing on this list will tell you, four blocks. Look, that's, not, that's just not possible. He's not going to maintain four blocks a night. He's probably also not going to maintain 78% shooting. He's probably also not going to be able to maintain 100% from the free throw line. Now, that is on limited attempts, of course. I think he's, what, two of two from the line over the last two weeks. But it's still there. Like If he's one of two from the line, then that drops that number down. Your 78% goes down to a very good 70%. And then again, you're down 10 spots, 15 spots. The four blocks goes to three blocks. Still good, but you're losing 25% of your value in that category. So while he's playing really well and he's tying big minutes in with big blocks, big field goals, big free throws, it's jumped his ranking absolutely through the roof. Williams for this season is the 48th ranked player. And again, I think top 50, top 40 is reasonable for him rest of season. But just see if anyone wants to bite. Look for the Hassan Whiteside lovers in your league. The guys that had him. I remember when Whiteside was a top 10 player. All right, cool. Here's your new Hassan Whiteside. Right? They just think that these numbers aren't going to be able to stick. Keeping it on the track of centers and on the track of players who are going to have guys coming back. Daniel Gafford in Washington. 
He has real, like, I, I think he's a solid enough player. Like, I don't think he's a very good, excellent, dominating, all-star level center or anything like that. I think he's quite a good defensive center. He's a good rim protector. He's the best defensive big man on that team by a significant margin. But he also has been playing like 22 minutes a night most of the season. But recently, with the absence of Harrell and still no return of Tom Bryant, he's seen the minutes go up to 29. He's only playing 23 for the season and he's the 92nd ranked player. But you jump those minutes up to 29 and look, look what you have. Top 40 or well, top 45 player. Actually right on the nose, 45th ranked player. In points leagues, it's not as big of a jump. He's up to 81st, but he's barely a rosterable player in points leagues normally. And now he's turned into a top 100 guy because the minutes are there. Averaging 13 and 8, over two blocks and an astonishing 86% from the field. We expect that to come down, but he, like Rob Williams, can be 70 plus. The 13 points, it's fine, but it's all tied into 29 minutes. As soon as Harrell is back, the 29 minutes isn't going to stick. It might be 25, he might play same games at 27. And then the big question mark is, what the hell happens when Thomas Bryant returns? The most confident I feel is saying Thomas Bryant is not coming back and playing 28 minutes a night. That's what I feel confident in. A big man with two other established centers there who struggles at defense coming off an ACL is not coming in and demanding a 28 to 30 minute a night starting off. I feel confident in saying that part. But as for the rest of it, I don't know. Do they play three centers? Does someone miss out? Is that someone Gafford? Is that someone Bryant? Does Montrez Harrell get traded? I, I honestly don't know. But I do know that the sell high window on Gafford, if, if you were taking a piss out that window, you're going to lose your dick. It's going to close that quickly on it. Like that is how fast this sell high window is going to close. So get any top 70 guy back for Gafford. Any top 80 guy I would get for Gafford. I, I like Gafford. But if I can get a top 80 player in a trade, immediately. I'm doing it absolutely immediately. Malik Monk playing really well. He's one of those guys that if he's on your waiver wire, you add him. We love what he's doing. But there is an element of unsustainability in what Malik Monk's producing at the moment. Kendrick Nunn will return at some point. Maybe. Anthony Davis will return at some point. But here's my hot take for you. Malik Monk's a better player than Kendrick Nunn. Like, clearly, in my mind. And Davis is obviously a big, a big part of that team and a huge usage guy. And we just don't know what Vogel is thinking in terms of, is it Monk or Bradley that loses out more when um, Nunn returns? Is it Reeves? Like, what are they going to do with that rotation? Monk, over the last two weeks, is playing 34 minutes a night. That's really good. He is the 36th ranked player in category leagues, 78th in points leagues. He's averaging 20 points per game flat. He's averaging, or well, shooting 48% from three. So there's a couple of red flags here in terms of the value. 34 minutes a night, it's very high. 48% from three, it's very high. Hitting 90% from the line, oh, you can do that. That's fine. 51% from the field, obviously very high because that includes 55% from two. But 1.3 blocks, Malik Monk. No, no, no. That's not going to stick. He is the... 137th ranked player this year in 26 minutes. I've got him to be about 100th, 110th rest of season because I do expect the shooting numbers, the usage, the minutes, the blocks, all of that to come back down. If I could get any... Now, I said I've got him like 100, 110 rest of season. I wouldn't accept a top 100 player back for him. I'd rather ride out this hot streak and see, hey, maybe he is a 45% three-point shooter. Maybe he is a 34-minute a night guy. I really doubt it, especially when Davis is back. I write it out. But if someone wants to give me top 75, then I take that. And I go, okay. I will. And again, in a lot of these buy low, sell high situations, you're going to take a hit in the interim. Like if I trade Malik Monk off now, he will probably be like a top 50 guy for maybe three weeks. And then I've only got a top 70 guy back. And I go, well, that's a shit trade. But it's not about that. It's about, okay, I take a short... Because if you're not taking a short-term hit... Why is the other person going to be interested in it? You got There's got to be that trade-off and you've got to be looking longer term. You get top 50 for two weeks and then he goes back to 120 for the next eight weeks. All right, short-term pain, long-term gain. I think that's how the phrase goes. Something like that anyway. But that is how I would be approaching that one. Let's look at some buy lows now. And let's start with the double royal, Julius Randle. Randall, it appears, may have been a one-hit wonder. And that's not a surprise. 
Uh, we talked about this a lot in the preseason about, hey, there's, he's done this for one year and there's gigantic, huge increases in numbers which don't feel real and maybe there's a drop off. I didn't expect it to drop this much. But despite the criticisms of Randall, he still is the 50th ranked player this season. But the last two weeks have been rough. He's 116th in category leagues, 44th in points leagues. This is a bloke last year in points leagues that was an easy top 20 guy. And this year in points leagues, he's 28th. All right, so that slide is, is a big drop. So why is it happening? Well, where are the assists? 3.8 per game only. Like he gets by on getting six, six and a half. It's a big drop. It's still a good number for a power four, but it's not when you're one of your big categories is being a six assist player. The shooting, horrendous. 37% from the field. 37%. Like, stop taking shit shots. And I know it's really hard for him because that's just who he is. But man, stop it. 69 from the line. Giggity. Again, one of those things that last year he'd been a perennially poor free throw shooter and then became good. He went, all right, what, what's going on here? And then he went from being a 28% three-point shooter to a 40% three-point shooter. And he went, okay, that's weird. Well, over the last two weeks, he's shooting 19% from three. So while I can look at last year and go, that's bullshit, it's not continuing, I can also look at this and go, no one is continuing to shoot at that sort of horrific level which is what's his true shooting over this time. It's got to be something embarrassing here. 42.8. Like, that is just embarrassing. And while I can look at Randall and say he's not as good as last year, 3.8 assists is improving, 37% field goals improving, 69 from the line, maybe not. 19% from three, yeah, that is definitely improving. In terms of where I see Randall rest of season, yeah, top 65, top 70 maybe. Like so, <coughs> a buy low on Randall... He's not going, well, I think he gets back to where he was last year. Um, so I'll give you a top 35 player. Like, that's nonsense, right? You see if his manager is frustrated. You see if he's losing. You see if your, his manager has a lot of injuries. And you just try and extract. Throw two bad players. Throw your 10th and 11th best player to get Randall. In a lot of these cases with guys with some track record, although it's not long-term for him, yeah, there is a track record for Randall. Just throw a couple of guys in and see what you get. Because he's been frustrating. He is one of the most frustrating players in the NBA, and that doubles over into fantasy as well. So just try it. Scotland Barnes on the buy low. We'll all, I wonder if the Scotty Barnes fan club will come into the comments here and tell me how ridiculous I am for having him on this show this time. He has been, let's be fair, shithouse. Like, 225th ranked player over the last two weeks. 127th in um, points leagues. It's bad. That's why he sold high when he was top 25. He is the 78th ranked player this year. I think a ranking for rest of season for him between 80 to 100 is reasonable. But honestly, if from here on out he finished just outside the top 100, I wouldn't be completely surprised. The reason I don't think that'll be the case is I don't expect this team's lineup to stay fully healthy all season. And that's where Barnes has thrived. Siakam goes out, Ananobi goes out. Birch goes out, Trent goes out, Van Vliet goes out, Barnes steps up. They all come back, Barnes shrinks away. And at the moment, they're all there. So Barnes has shrunk right away. And it's, again, one of the, I don't know, I need to have a, a, a term for this, but when you're met with a situation where opportunity decreases and then you pair that with lower permanent production as well as poor shooting, it gives you a gigantic dip. So he's in a situation where usage has dropped, right? But he's also paired that with bad shooting. So you could be in a spot where your usage drops, but you keep your shooting up. You keep your steal rate up. You keep all that stuff up, and it doesn't look like that bad. And that's the opposite of when someone gets increased opportunity, Malik Monk, and then they bump their shooting numbers out to completely unsustainable, Kyle Kuzma. And then it makes their numbers jump 50 spots, whereas Barnes has done the opposite. So over the last two weeks, he's shooting 39 from the field, 64 from the line, and 20% from three. The one thing I'll say about that is, is that if you told me Scotty Barnes was averaging those numbers at the start of the season, before the NBA season started, coming out of Florida State, I would have said, I actually tracks, makes, makes a bit of sense. Because that's sort of what he was at Florida State. I would have gone, all right, that's what's going to happen. A rookie that can't shoot in the NBA. Uh, we sort of expect that. So I look at all those numbers and go, they're too low. But may maybe the top, the first 30 games were him shooting out of his mind and not real. I don't know. I still think there is improvement here for Barnes. And the 0.8 steals is pretty low. He should be able to get over one per game. But he's averaging 9.6, 6.4, and 4. 
only 0.63s. Everything has dried up. Do not expect old Scotty Barnes, top 50 Scotty Barnes to come back, but do expect improvements, especially if someone gets hurt. Josh the Hitman Hart, 236th over the last two weeks, 73rd in points leagues. Hart has been very good this season, surprisingly good. He's the 79th ranked player. Started on opening night, hurt his knee, then didn't play after they went, oh, okay, well, where are we going from here? Um, they were starting Alexander Walker, um, and I didn't know where Hart's season was going to go. By far the best season of his career. This is not to do with minutes. He's playing 36 a night. It's due to the fact that over the last four games, he has one steal. So that's 0.3 a game. One steal in four games. Not good. He's shooting 60% from the line on over six attempts per game. And that is just going to drop your numbers way down. He's also shooting 26% from three. He's still averaging nine boards. He's still getting five assists. He's averaging 14 points. All that is fine. It's just a matter of the free throws are off, the three-pointers are off, and he's not getting steals. And these things can correct really quickly. So I look at Hart as a top 80, 90 player. See what you can get. Throw a top 100. Throw your worst two guys. Throw your three worst guys at him. He'll be better than this, and this is just a bit of a slump in his numbers. His teammates also on the list, starting point guard Devontae Graham. And when I say starting point guard and you're averaging 3.8 assists, well, there's some problems, isn't there? He's 190th over the last two weeks, 147th in points leagues. He's been all over the shop, really, Graham. He's had moments where I'm going, I don't know if he's a rosterable bloke. And then he fires up and you go, he's top 80 for this time. And I'm still not sold on where he sits in 12-team leagues. I've got him 120th here on out. He's 122nd for the season. But, like, struggling at the moment. 190th. 3.8 assists is where it's really hurting, though. Like, this should be a 5-6 to six assist player. But the problem we're seeing here is that Ingram... And Josh Hart are handling the ball, and Graham's sort of just spotting up. Now, he's hitting his threes, fine. Three threes a game, 15 points a game. But when you get two rebounds under four assists, and in his six games, he's had two steals in six games, and you're shooting 36% overall from the field, well, there's some issues. Now, you know you're punting field goals with this bloke, but you would have hoped six or seven assists could come, especially without Zion Williamson. But we're not getting that. And lastly, let's go to Cade Cunningham. I think Cade has a real shot at a top 50 finish from here on out. But he'd want to bloody do better than he's doing now. 154th over the last two weeks, 103rd in points leagues. He has come back from COVID protocols and he cannot shoot at the moment. 37% from the field. It's a struggle. 29% from three. And there you go. Always the low three-point percentage you've got to watch for because three-point percentage influences three separate categories. So you shoot poorly there and you drop in three categories. He's also getting only 0.8 steals. That's three steals in four games. He could be a 1.5 steals guy. He's averaging just 15 points. Like, I think Cade is a top 50 guy rest of season. In fact, this season so far, despite having some struggles, he's still 66th. And I think he gets better from here. But this is a real drop-off. In large part because n nothing's going in. Averaging under 15 points as well. Like, that needs to change for him. And I think it will. So buying low on him for with a top 80 guy, a top 90 guy, I think he's the, the right target. Even if the top 75 guy, I would do that to get Cade Cunningham. That'll do it for me today. I'll be back later on with the pregame show and then a What to Watch For show. Don't forget to follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. If you are here on YouTube, though, give it a thumbs up and leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. <laughs>